morning, church. Good morning. Can you all hear me okay? Yeah. What a wonderful thing it is to be able to gather together. I have missed seeing all your faces. I recognize most of you. Um, hopefully you recognize me. I'm Pastor Karen Larson, and you know, the scar probably tells you that and nothing else. Uh, this rule that I'm holding is what six feet looks like. I announced that in worship on one day when we were outside. And you'll see that in your pews there are uh, noodles. For the most part, the noodles in your pews, because they are open, are green. So, you know, we say go green. Uh, and what they are for is to help you know what six feet looks like. Because we don't know if one person is going to sit on the end, or two people, or an entire family. And whoever's on the end of a group or a unit can simply put that next to them, and the next person knows where six feet is. So use your noodle. More days than one. Just a couple of other announcements that I have, and it is wonderful to see all of you here. We know that there are many in our community who are simply not going to worship with us until there's a COVID uh, vaccine. God bless them. Sometimes they, uh, very often they have either a family member or they themselves have risk factors. And so we support them in their decision. And while it makes us sad because we miss them, uh, we know that God is taking care of all of us. The truth is that with numbers increasing, we don't know how long we are going to be able to meet in person like this. But we are going to make the most of it because God is great. And we are here to proclaim that, to worship God, and to praise God. But our worship is going to look a little bit different. That distancing thing is only a part of it. Many of you are sitting in seats that you normally wouldn't sit in because it's not your seat. So it will introduce us to a new way of sitting. It will introduce us to a new way of being. We don't need to fear being brothers and sisters of Christ and warmly welcoming each other. But we will not do that through handshakes or hugs. And we will try, whether we're coming or going or sitting in our pews, to maintain that safe six-foot distancing. Research tells us, however, that when we are uh, loudly speaking, singing, laughing, the little droplets that contain that wicked virus can be projected as many as 26 or 30 feet. And so you will see the assisting minister and myself up here in this chancel area the entire time. The band members will be staying up there. They will be distancing as much as they can reasonably do, and they'll be wearing masks. At times, we'll simply have smaller group singing or even um, solo singing or other musical uh, ways of uh, ways of worshiping and praising God. Unfortunately, what we know about this virus is that congregational singing is really not safe. And I know that there are some churches that are doing it. But the research tells us that we want to be safe rather than sorry. To date, uh, as far as I know, we've had no COVID here at Zion. I do know that there are some family members of members who have had COVID. Uh, and there are some of us who have lost loved ones due to COVID. And we certainly want to be as safe as we can as we gather together. And to be able to meet together as long as we're taking these precautions. And so I invite your comments and your questions and your angst and your uh, all of the feelings that that engenders in us, but those are the reasons that we're doing things the way that we're doing. And I think most of you are all here to get that. In addition, we do have a few places in the congregation in the worship where we will have congregational responses. And we urge you to say those quietly and not robustly, the way that I know we normally do. You love to shout out the Lord's Prayer, right? You love when I say, the Lord be with you, to shout out, and also with you. I will still get your message, even if you say it quietly. Uh, there are no printed materials, except for those who uh, really uh, feel more uh, secure. Perhaps you have low vision, or these screens are just not as clear as possible. And unfortunately, just this week, when we were having them serviced, that projector did something really wonky, and so we have no projector on this side. Uh, if looking on this screen is too much for you, if you're sitting on this side, or if you did not get a large print uh, printout on your way in, 
we may still have a couple left where we're printing just a few, trying to figure out how many we actually need. And that's the other thing that we, we appreciate if you understand about all that we're doing. We have a great deal of thanks to give to the COVID task force. Most of the members are here today. So let's give an affirmation.
your throne in our hearts. Created by you, let us live in your image. Created for you, let us act for your glory. Redeemed by you, let us give you what is yours. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. The first lesson is from Isaiah 45th chapter, verses 1 through 7. Thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have grasped, to subdue nations before him, and strip kings of their robes, to open doors before him, and the gates shall not be closed. I will go before you and level the mountains. I will break in pieces the doors of bronze and cut through the bars of iron. I will give you the treasures of darkness and riches hidden in secret places, so that you may know that it is I, the Lord, the God of Israel, who call you by your name. For the sake of my servant Jacob and Israel, my chosen, I call you by your name. I surname you. Though you do not know me, I am the Lord and there is no other. Beside me there is no God. I arm you, though you do not know me, so that they may know, from the rising of the sun and from the west, there, there is no one beside me. I am the Lord, and there is no other. I form light and create darkness. I make real and create woe. I, the Lord, do all these things. The word of the Lord. Thank you, God. The responsive reading from Psalms is from Psalm 96, 1 through 9. O oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all the peoples. Praise the Lord, and great be to be praised. He is to be revered all. For all the gods of the peoples are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory in His name. Bring an honor and the kindness of His courts. <coughs> Worship the Lord in holy splendor. Tremble before Him all the earth. The second reading is from 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 1 through 10. Paul. Silvanus and Timothy, to the church of Thessalonians, and God the Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace. We always give thanks to God for all of you and mention you in our prayers, constantly remembering before our God and Father your work of faith and labor, of love and steadfastness, of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers and sisters, beloved by God, that He has chosen you, because our message of the Gospel came to you, not in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. Just as you know what kind of persons we prove to be among you for your sake, and you became imitators of us, and of the Lord, for in spite of persecution, you received the word with joy, inspired by the Holy Spirit, so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and in Achaia. For the word the Lord has sounded forth from you not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but in every place your faith in God has become known so that we have no need to speak about it. 
For the people of those regions, report about us what kind of welcome we had among you, and how you turned to God from idols to serve a living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the wrath that is coming. The word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel comes to us from chapter 22 of the Gospel of St. Matthew. Glory to you, my Lord. The Pharisees went and plotted to entrap Jesus in what he said. So they sent their disciples to him, along with the Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you are sincere, and teach the way of God in accordance with truth, and show deference to no one. For you do not regard people with partiality. Tell us then what you think. Is it lawful to pay taxes to the emperor or not? But Jesus, aware of their malice, said, Why are you putting me to the test, you hypocrites? Show me the coin used for the tax. And they brought him a denarius. Then he said to them, Whose head is this, and whose title? And they answered, The emperor's. Then he said to them, Give therefore to the emperor what is the emperor's, and to God the things that are God's. When they heard this, they were amazed, and they left him and went away. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. Amen. Once again, I say to you, good morning, church. Although there are some who will be watching this service online or who will be watching it a little bit later today, this is the first time in many months that we have been able to gather together in this sanctuary to worship and praise God. And what a, a glorious day to rejoice in God this is. It is fabulous beyond belief to see you, whether I recognize you or not. I don't know how many times or for how long, as I said in the announcements earlier, that we'll be able to meet together like this. But I know that while we are here, while we are joined together, we rejoice and are glad. For the truth of the matter is that we live in such uncertain times, don't we? Each and every one of us has to make a lot of decisions any given day about how to live our lives and how to simply comport ourselves in private as well as in public. And we know that whatever it is that we decide today, as I was saying in the announcements earlier, what we learn tomorrow may lead us to entirely different decisions and in different directions. We have to process a lot of new information on a continual basis. And as we meet today, we are but 16 days away from an election day in our country. In a year that has been unbelievable, unprecedented. We could not have imagined this in, in any of our dreams or nightmares, right? So as your pastor, I stand here today and I ask you, how are you holding up? How is it with your soul these days? How are you doing? If you're anything like me, you receive tons of information online, over the phone, in the mail, in magazines, in newspapers. There's so much information to process. So much information to toss in the circular bin, as Darla was just uh, demonstrating <laughs> for us. If you're like me, you're receiving a lot of election-related material each day. My recycling pile grows by leaps and bounds. You probably have phone calls coming in as well, and perhaps like me, you're even receiving texts. 
You cannot turn into the television without being bombarded by political ads. And with each one, you simply watch and you shake your head. Every one of them is trying to tell you how you should vote, that you should vote for their candidate, and here's why. And then the rest of the ad is filled with information, misinformation, the rest. I know that I have grown quite weary of all of it. Not if you are in the same camp as I am. I see a lot of nodding going on. So I have a question for you. Have you made up your mind yet? Have you already voted by mail or are you holding out, planning to hit up the ballot boxes the earliest opportunity you can come November 3rd? But here's the real burning question I have in my mind. I know that you are all sincere, faithful people who follow Jesus Christ and you shape your lives after his teaching. So with that in mind, who are you voting for? Who is the president of your choice this year? Or your congressman or woman? Who is your choice to fill the various other positions in, on this year's ballot? Perhaps it's a good thing that we're all wearing masks and we aren't supposed to speak out loud right now, right? Don't worry. I'm not really expecting you to answer that question. Unlike the Pharisees in today's gospel reading, I am not testing you or trying to put you on the spot. Honestly, I'm not. As we look at the passage before us, what we see is that truly the Pharisees and Herodians were testing Jesus on that day. They were trying to trap him. They were trying to trip him up. We know that when they asked him, is it lawful to pay taxes to the emperor or not, it was a trick question, which no matter how he answered it, was going to get Jesus in trouble. The Pharisees of Jesus' day, after all, saw this as a tribute tax, as a heretical and political submission to the pagan emperor. Not a good thing. Whereas the Herodians would see refusal to pay or a suggestion that we should not pay it as sedition. Also, not a good thing. And so what is Jesus to say? How is he to answer this lose-lose proposition or question? And yet everyone is standing there and Jesus is on display. And he's in the spotlight and he needs to answer. Who are you voting for? Should we pay this tax or not? So Jesus takes the Roman coin and he holds it up and offers an answer that bridges the gap between religious and secular expectations of the day, making his answer a teaching opportunity as, of course, this is Jesus. Jesus always does. Give to the emperor what is the emperor's, and give to God what is God's, he responds. As author and theologian Debbie Thomas writes, how typical of Jesus. Not only to respond to a challenge with an even greater challenge, but to insist that the relationship between faith and politics is too complex to reduce to platitudes or tweets. We have Jesus' words in front of us. What does Jesus not say? He doesn't say that there are two realms and they are separate but equal and ne'er the twain shall meet. He doesn't say that we can live our lives divided, that to live in the world we should go one way, but when in church or considering our religious selves, live in an entirely other way. Instead, he points to a coin which bears the image of the emperor. In the Roman world, the emperor in Roman occupied lands, the emperor was considered to be like a god. One's loyalty and service and everything else is owed to the emperor. But from the opening chapters of Genesis, we know that human beings you and me and all people who ever have or ever will walk the face of the earth are created in the likeness of God. We bear God's image. Therefore, 
since it is God's signature on each and every one of us, since it is God's image with which we are stamped and in whose image we have been formed. If we follow Jesus' analogy and his reasoning here, we belong to God and we owe God everything, including our very being. Everything we have and everything we own comes from God and belongs to God. We often hear this kind of message during stewardship campaigns, at times when we need to make big decisions in the church or for the church, and at times when we must determine what portion of our riches we will return in the form of an offering to God. Everything we have and everything we own comes from God and belongs to God and shall be returned to God. Isn't that what we've been taught? But our lives do not equal our riches. Our lives include things like our bodies and what we do with them and how we treat them, and our words and what we do with them and how we use them. And as followers of Jesus Christ, we are called to a special kind of living, incorporating all aspects of our lives into our discipleship. Included in what we owe God are the ways in which we are called to bear the image of God in our choices, among our friends, and in our interactions, to what we devote our time and our loyalties to, and so much more, even the way we vote. Each and every one of us here must decide for ourselves what does it mean to give to God what belongs to God in these hard and divisive days. Again, turning to Debbie Thomas, how do we bear forth God's image while our families, communities, and churches splinter over political and cultural differences that seem unbridgeable? How do we live into the all-encompassing reign of God while a scorched earth, ideology-driven, the ends justify the means, divisiveness reigns within American Christendom? As Christians, how do we know how to answer any of these questions other than to look to Jesus, who calls us to be his disciples, who calls us to be his own, who calls us to live lives in ways that point to his justice and love. And here's the rub. Different people will interpret that and what it means differently. Jesus, the one who refuses to take the bait when asked this tough, tr tricky question, still answers with wisdom and righteousness. He remains faithful to God while making it clear that what comes in the name of the emperor isn't the ultimate life-giving gift of unearned grace and mercy that comes only from God. The thing is that as Christians dedicated to living lives shaped by Jesus Christ, every action we take, every decision we make, every single thing we ascribe to, every engagement in which we enter, every word we utter, every day we live, and how we do each and every one of these things is as inseparable from who we are are as the image in which God made us his own, in which God imprinted his very own countenance with which he stamped us. That is our call. We are God's. We are shaped with his image. We are called by him to live in his grace and mercy. And this, my friends, is our reality. As Christians, we bear the image, the love and mercy of God to the world, and we do not alter or abandon it for some greater social or political or economic end result. We can't isolate our political choices and actions from who we are as children of God and followers of Jesus Christ. If everything belongs to God, then our political and spiritual lives must bear that same God to the world, and, we must, and they must not contradict each other.
each other. We aren't one kind of Christian on Sunday and another kind of Christian the rest of the week, a charge that is often lobbed at Christians by those who are disenfranchised through engagement with any Christian church. So we look to Jesus. We look to Jesus to determine how to practice our faith in the political realm and in the religious realm and in the spiritual realm and in the secular realm, in our personal lives, in our public lives, in our financial and economic lives, and in our worship and praise activities. Following Jesus, we see that there is no way to offer God our whole selves other than to live in humility and kindness, forgiveness, compassion, generosity, and sacrificial love. For God will be my God, regardless of who resides in the White House. I will continue to owe my life and every good thing in it to this God of freedom and generosity, steadfast love and mercy, justice and goodness. Unlike the emperor, God is not a tyrant, does not weigh favors and riches as reflective of his glory. Therefore, since you and I and our sisters here and our brothers there are fashioned in the image of God, then we are compelled to practice our lives with integrity and loyalty to God alone. Then and only then will we remember and appreciate that the God whose image we bear is a God of eternal and redeeming love, who rules a kingdom that is boundless. It is into this kingdom life that God calls us, for it is here that Jesus shapes us, and through his kingdom that we participate in the reign of God that is eternal and all-encompassing. What should we give to God? Everything. What will you be given? Eternal joy. Bliss, the blessing of grace upon grace upon grace. Amen.
Gracious God, you call us by name and invite us to share your good news. Send your Holy Spirit among preachers, missionaries, evangelists, and all believers. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of praise, the heavens and all creation declare your salvation. The changing foliage of fall shouts the beauty of your creation. From the rising of the sun to its setting, may the whole universe show forth your goodness. Raise up the devoted stewards of all that you have made. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of all, may your word of justice sound forth in every place. Restore divided nations and communities with reconciling truth. May we all be sisters and brothers, sharing your love for all creation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of light, we pray for those living with pain, illness, isolation, grief, anger, or doubt. We pray especially for the family and friends of Kelly Rainier, Eugene and Doris, Jenny, Christine, Deanne's son, Beverly, Jerry, Avery, Hoshi, Elaine, President Trump, and all those affected by COVID. For those affected by wildfires, hurricanes, and flooding. Wendell, Evelyn, Evelyn, Helen, Jim, Mary, Mark, Pat, Seth, Mary Lou, Steve, Florence, Janet, Rosa, Linda Stufus, and the Amish community.
May the blessing of Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you now and forever. Amen. Amen. Just a couple of announcements before we have our final song. Uh, the first is that next week our worship will be outdoors at this time, the 10 day or whatever it is, 7 day, but the forecast looks like it'll be clear. We do have our FM transmitter, so unless it would be driving rain or something that would really drive the band not to be able to play and the pastor not to be able to stand there and get drenched, then um, we would have that service outside. If the weather were to turn really ugly, then we would come inside. The week after, which is November 1st, also the day we change our calendar, our, our clock, so don't forget that, um, we do have our All Saints Day, and we will be having a remembrance as we always do. We will have one that's posted online as well as one that we have here in church. And so if you have someone who has passed away, friend, family, loved one, um, please go ahead and get those names into the church office as soon as possible. We need to make that list up. Uh, so that's a, a word about that. Um, although we had no communion today, as I said earlier, we will have weekly communion and they will be done very much as we did if you ever came to one of our outdoor worship services, I think probably most of you did. You'll get a prepackaged uh, communion set on your way in. Um, we have gluten free as well, and so um, we will go ahead and, and have communion um, in the future. If you were not here and have not looked at your email this week, then um, just a, a bit of news that the vote for Steps to Success to move forward with that was a positive vote. Uh, in fact, it was an overwhelmingly positive vote last week, so thank you for your presence here uh, last week and for your vote. The work now truly begins uh, for that group uh, with getting things ready so that hopefully um, soon after the new year turns, they'll be able to house their children uh, in that place. Um, the only other thing that I have is that we do we, we do continue an online worship presence. Uh, we're trying, uh, and today we have a, a live uh, fa uh, Facebook feed. We're also recording to get on YouTube, so if you cannot be here, or if you have friends who are unsure about coming, first of all, you can tell them about the practices that we put into place to allay some of their fears. Uh, but again, we respect and honor the, the decisions that others are making to keep themselves safe. Please let them know that we still have that online presence, and we will continue the mailings as we have been regarding worship um, as we move forward uh, into um, this continuing uh, realm that we're in. And so now I um, welcome you to just remain in your seats as we continue with the sending song, and then there will be a dismissal. And on your way out, please just remember to respect that six foot distancing. It's really hard. Uh, we think four feet or three feet is like six feet. It's really not. Remember your movement. Think, use your movement. Okay. So that being said, we sing. <laughs> <laughs> 